Our next panel, competing with skills, winning with confidence. Many of you have reached out to us about how to get a job in areas where you don't yet have experience. You've learned new skills, you're now looking for the next job. How do you go about doing that? The paradox of getting a job when you can't get hired without prior experience, you see this on resumes a lot, you know, five plus years experience here, three plus years experience there. How do you do that? That's actually really common in the new modern hiring era with the changing of jobs. Similarly, how do you have confidence to apply for these new roles when you may not feel confident yet about your experience? Our next panelists discuss why and how confidence matters, explore the complex relationships between skills and confidence, and share strategies for turning that to your career advantage. Our panel moderator is Kathleen Mullaney, VP of Careers at Udacity. Kathleen joined Udacity as one of our first employees in 2011. She's a frequent speaker at education and tech conferences, and prior to Udacity, worked as a data analyst on Google Maps, where she created tools to help improve team processes and map data quality. Kathleen is joined by our panelists, Aileen Lerner, co-founder and CEO at interviewing.io, Nico Rose, VP of Employer Branding and Talent Acquisition at Bertelsmann, Aubrey Blanche, Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Atlassian, and Chapman Snowden, founder and CEO at Signal.io. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our, our panel. Uh, as Clarissa introduced, it, we are talking about competing with skills and winning with confidence. So a lot of people in the room today have completed a nano degree program, or maybe you're in a nano degree program today. You're gaining a ton of new skills. And what do you do next with them? Uh, what, we've, what we've learned, and actually what, what is the wisdom of this panel and many others, is that it's not just the skills that you have, it's also the confidence. It's the way that you go forth, and you actually share those skills with the world. And so we're going to talk more about that today and hopefully give you some practical advice on how to increase your confidence uh, in many different situations. Uh, and I'm particularly excited to have this diverse crowd of experts because uh, we have, uh, you know, when I, when I was learning all of this myself firsthand, I didn't know that there were experts. <laughs> so it's, it's nice that we can actually pull together a panel of people who have, are, are engineers, who are psychologists, uh, who have, are working at, at companies who are, you know, managing thousands of people uh, to actually help them, you know, manage their own careers. And, and that's who we have uh, here with you today. So, CHAP, just to give people a little bit more context where this expertise comes from, CHAP here uh, is the founder of Traverse. It's a smart research assistant. Uh, before that, he was at Dev Bootcamp uh, running product and also creating education products with Google. Um, he is also a self-taught developer, yep. which I think uh, many, many of you in this room can relate to. Uh, Aileen is the co-founder and CEO of Interviewing.io, which is a blind interviewing platform, and it's one that also many of you probably have practiced with. Uh, she also, for a brief period, ran hiring at Udacity, so we're, we're <laughs> grateful to have her back. Um, and something you might know, if we've, we actually share often her blog posts about uh, data in recruiting, uh, where she shows that typos actually often matter more uh, than pedigree and, and many other insights. Uh, Aubrey Blanche here is the, head, the, the global head of diversity and inclusion at Atlassian, and who doesn't use Atlassian products? Jira, Confluence, Trello, all of these. We use all of those at Udacity. So, and it's a huge company that is, uh, 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 many of people are remote, actually. And so there's, there's a ton of, again, like uh, insight here coming from <laughs> a variety of angles. Um, and last, we have Dr. Nico Rose. So Nico is uh, our international contingent uh, coming to <laughs> us from Germany, uh, where he's the vice president of employer branding and, and talent at Bertelsmann. Uh, which is uh, Europe's leading media uh, company. 
Uh, Bertelsmann, and Nico will maybe mention this later, will say, say that Bertelsmann is the company behind many, many uh, companies and, and products that you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with that name itself. Um, he's a proponent of positive psychology. Uh, hopefully, he'll come up later today that he a, has a doctorate, but not in, in what he does here today. And we have a variety of, of career backgrounds here that, that we'll be happy to share. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, panel, for joining us. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start off with a, a question that I'd hope that each of you will answer. Um, because of the, the varied back backgrounds that you have, uh, the common thread is, is really around technology and also around empowerment, uh, empowering people from broad backgrounds to increase their, their access and their opportunity. And that is really what we're talking about here. This lifelong learning really needs that empowerment and, and access to opportunity for it to really work. So uh, feeling confident versus acting confident. Uh, what behaviors uh, do confident people have that we all can adopt? And we can, we can start with you, Chap, or, or anybody who, who wants, wants to kick this off. Do you want to go? Yeah. You can see the collective confidence on the <laughs> panel right now. You can answer this. No confidence at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll start, I'll start us off. I think uh, for the people I, I admire who exude confidence, I think both act and, and come... Uh, come off as confident, it's a sort of consistent process of mapping things that they don't understand back to sort of some mental model that they understand. Um, and I think uh, actually a person who's great at this is Elon Musk, uh, classically trained as a physicist, and so constantly sort of like when doesn't understand something, brings it back to first principles of this discipline that he understands, which is physics, and that can sort of extrapolate from there. And so I think depending upon what you've you know, sort of call your sort of innate mental model or mental models. Um, I think a great thing is sort of understand when encountering something that you don't understand, bring it back to what you do and sort of work from there. Yeah, I would say the other thing, and this is um, something about confident people that they know about other people, which is that uh, even other confident people don't know everything. Um, I think we can tell ourselves these stories that like, oh, that person knows everything. I have to you know, talk about my skills in a glass half empty way, or I need to caveat this. Um, and it turns out that you don't need to do that. Even super confident people don't know what they're talking about sometimes. And sort of, right, that's true. Um, <laughs> so, like Elon sometimes doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, and that's okay. So I think holding that allows you to approach, you know, to get back to the piece where you are confident, but knowing that being out there outside of your expertise doesn't mean you're not an expert at something. I'll add that um, it's having a bit of swagger because your worst fears have come true. <laughs> so whether it's messing up an interview or uh, you know messing up some kind of public speaking engagement, if, if it's happened and you've gotten through it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So part of confidence, I think, is, is failing a lot and, and learning from those failures, but also realizing that no matter how bad you thought it was going to be, it's not that bad. <laughs> Well, if you translate the German word for confidence back into English, it actually means self-trust. So trusting yourself. And the question is, when do you trust somebody? Mostly when you know somebody. So I think that confidence comes from finding out what your real strengths are. And you can do that by taking tests online. But I think also one important way is just getting lots of feedback. So sometimes you, you know about your own strengths, but a lot of times the strength in you that you don't even see yourself, but other people can, can tell you that. And bringing those real strengths to an interview situation is something that's very strong and authentic, as opposed to you know, saying, like, oh, I'm, I'm really oh, impatient. That's what you get a lot on the interviews. I, I don't know where to hear that. I, I want to hear your real strength. And if you know about that and bring that to the interview, that's something very, very strong and authentic. So to, to follow up that one, um, how do you actually grow your confidence? And any, anybody can take this now. I research, um, <laughs> right? So in a former life, before I ran DNI, I was actually an academic researcher. I studied military strategy, right? So I'm highly qualified for my job right now. <laughs> um, but I think I think that's it. Is for me researching two things. So trying to understand whatever I want to know, whether it's how to get a job or how to run a global DNI department. Um, but then also researching what other people don't know. That's true. So I'm a big fan of anyone who puts out like their resume of failures, right? I tell this story. When I tried to get into tech, I sent out 130 job applications and got three callbacks. 
Um, and so I think that's it, like whether it's talking to people, but understanding that your failures are actually quite normal and you, the, the success is a selection bias, like it's all you see, but it's usually like 1% of the outcomes. Um, I think that can help you realize that where you are in an experience is actually quite normal, if not exceptional, usually, especially if you're already sitting in this room. Um, so level set with yourself. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. So uh, the company I run called Interviewing IO um, helps people practice technical interviews and find jobs in the process. And we've amassed, I think, something like 20,000 technical interviews at this point. It's, it's a lot. And uh, one of the resounding themes we've seen over and over again is that people are not consistent in their performance, and even the best people fail quite often. In fact, only about 20% of people are consistent in how they perform, and everybody else is all over the place. So what ends up happening a lot of the time is uh, maybe you mess up an interview at Lyft, and you end up at Uber. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Lyft recruiters are contacting you immediately, or vice versa. And this is just part of this industry. So uh, failures are very real, but um, they're not an aberration. They're, they're actually the norm. And I'm sure this applies to non-technical interviewing as well. Yeah. I think first you all have to acknowledge that everybody is winging it all the time. We're totally winging it right now. <laughs> and that's, Completely. that's part of the game. You're winging it, the recruiter is winging it, and that takes a lot of the pressure out. At the same time, I do believe in a lot of practice, and that's not opposites. Mm -hmm. I do believe you need practice to what, what psychologists call self-efficacy. That's basically the scientific term for, for confidence. And uh, one way to build this up is kind of looking at your past successes, which is kind of a uh, no-brainer. But then what do you do when you are in a new situation? Um, sometimes it helps just to, to watch other people succeed, for example, in an online course. Um, and then a lot of practice. And you do practice not to bring your practice to the interview. It's not, uh, uh, recruiters typically, they don't want to hear a pitch. They want to hear a real person. So you do practice to be confident at winging it. That's what I believe in. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I would build on that concept of practice. I think often, especially when you're thinking about in the context of a, of a technical interview, you can go to HackerRank or any of these sites and sort of like see all of these different sort of canned examples that you'll probably be asked. Um, and I think oftentimes you can sort of get into this rut of like one particular solution to a problem. Um, I think a great way to enhance your practice is also to teach and find anybody. It doesn't matter whether they're technical or not but explain a topic because oftentimes what you get, and especially to those who are beginners, they'll ask a question that you've sort of abstracted over or glossed over. And you're like, oh wait, I've got to, yes, now I've got to go back and incorporate that into my answer. So sort of adopting both the, like, the learner and the teacher role is incredibly helpful in, in getting ready for any sort of like technical interview. Yeah, we actually see a lot of our, our students do this with each other. So if you're a Udacity student today, your peers are a great audience for you to practice teaching practice your interviewing skills, um, you know, absolutely take advantage of these opportunities because the more that you know, uh, you know today, the more that you're gonna be able to perform actually on the day of in your interview. Um, so uh, again, related because all of these are, all of these topics are gonna be related. Um, you know, for all of us in the tech industry, so everybody in this room and everybody probably online as well, um, Technology is changing so rapidly. We just heard that in the last panel. You know, all of these, all of these changes from you know digital surveying in in, uh, uh, in cities to you know self-driving cars. Uh, that technology is something that you can't be an expert in because it's going to change tomorrow. So if you if you if you know practice and knowledge is is you know helps you build confidence. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with you know a topic that's changing continuously? I think uh, programming languages change, but algorithms are forever. <laughs> um, Is that a greeting card? <laughs> <laughs> it should be. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, the most important thing is to understand how things work under the hood. Uh, Chap talked earlier about being a first principles thinker, and I think that that mentality is critical when you're teaching yourself to program and probably most, most other disciplines as well. So I wouldn't beat yourself up about the fact that by the time you become an expert at something, it's going to be completely obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> the, the journey uh, that you took to become the expert is going to be applicable to any number of things. And hopefully the companies where you interview are going to be interviewing you on your engineering aptitude, if you are an engineer, rather than on trivia. And if they're interviewing you on trivia, they're probably doing it wrong. <laughs>
Yeah, I would say, um, speaking from HR land, um, even you know Deloitte and McKinsey right now are talking about the fact that the half-life of skills, it used to be 10 years, now it's five. I imagine it'll be about two and a half. Uh, in the next decade. And so one of the things that like we at Atlassian look for, but I think you should understand to pull in one of your great comments is actually knowing how you learn and knowing how to do that really well, I think is the number one job skill that anyone can have. Because I can tell you, like I work in diversity, like my job title is like an evil joke. It's like you literally can't ever be good at it. Um, you can't know anything. And, and so for me, it's I know exactly once I have a target, how I learn, I'm a reader, I'm a visual person, I know how to go get the information I need or have the ability and humility to ask. Um, and if you can do that, you can become an expert in anything. Um, and that's what your career is gonna require of you for the next 10, 20 years anyway. Um, and I think saying something like that to a hiring manager is totally within bounds. Um, and I think you should, right? To say, I'm actually amazing at learning how to be great at this. I ramped up in this amount of time. I did a nano degree because I thought I could do it while juggling all of these other things. Isn't that amazing? People employ, I can, I can verify, you know, we've, we've helped thousands of people find, find jobs at Udacity and uh, p employers really do say this, that like their nano degree and having something to talk about that shows their grit and shows how much they were self-motivated to, to grow their own skills while you know, having a family managing another job um, is something that is, is, is really a skill that's laudable. So I think one thing to, to cultivate in, in yourself is what Carol Dweck from Stanford University called growth mindset as opposed to fixed mindset. Fixed mindset is basically where you shut down and you know, you know everything that you already should know. And if you cultivate that mindset, you basically become afraid of learning, you become afraid of growing, and you become afraid of not knowing something, and just seeing yourself as a, as a constant learner, and also actually finding a boss that encourages you to, to learn and grow and, and see the potential as opposed to what's, what's already there is something that's very crucial. And the truth is you, you, you will never stop learning. I learn something new every week. And um, there's always some, at least sometimes, there's some pain in, in, in growing. That's, that's part of what you do. And a little bit of in, in enjoying that pain of growth, I think it's uh, <laughs> something that we all should cultivate. And then you get the joy after being gritty and, and you've grown and that brings you new success. And then comes the next growth phase and that will continue for all of our lives. And I encourage you to search for that pain. So the rest of the panel, to riff off of Nico, uh, nature versus nurture. Are people born with certain attributes that make them better for certain jobs? Do you agree or, or disagree? Is it, is it nature or nurture? <sighs> That's it's a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Yeah, a, a 19 minutes looks like. Yeah. Uh, probably not going to get it through 19 <laughs> minutes. Um, it's a combination of both is sort of the cop on answer, I think. Um, but also the, the answer I believe in. Um, I think it's, you can train yourself to think in many different ways. It's sort of a function of how much time you have and what's the, what's the priority through it. Um, if it's an exercise that's just theoretical, then that can be more difficult. If it's a place where you see sort of like future utility or there's some application for it, I think that can be really helpful in training. If you struggle with algorithms, for, for example, because you don't understand the math behind it, like that gives you a really concrete way to say, okay, I don't need to know all of discrete math, or I don't need to know all of calculus. I just need to know around the specific universe. Um, so I think there's there's a bit of it which is sometimes it just comes intuitively, and sometimes you can you can give yourself sort of like a narrow enough application to be able to learn the stuff that you that you need to know. Yeah, I agree. I think that we probably all lean certain ways, but I think that those natural leanings are actually largely irrelevant. Um, right, so I think that we do have different aptitudes, um, but it's more about what we do with them than anything, right? Do we have the opportunity to stretch and grow? Um, because I can, right, I, I can tell you, I have sort of a natural facility with languages, like I've always found learning them pretty easy, but like there becomes a point where like Arabic is just hard, and so it doesn't matter that like the first few vocabulary revs I did were easy. Um, and so we may all have different ceilings where it gets hard, but the fact is, it's actually not about when it gets hard, it's what we do when it does. 
So I would tie back that question to what I said in the beginning on uh, the importance of strength. So one way to find out what your real strengths are is to look at stuff that you're learning exceptionally fast. So if you start something, if you start learning an instrument, if you start to code, and you have a peer group, and you find out that you learn considerably faster than everybody else, that's a sure sign that there's a lot of nature to be nurtured, right? So if you find something like that, build on that and, and make the other things irrelevant. And there's some things where nurture is a little more important, there's something where nature is a little more important, at the end of the day, everybody of us has certain strengths, and, and finding that out at best early in your life is really the path to, to constant growth. Yeah. I don't know. I think that what matters most is whether you care about the thing you're doing. If you don't have a natural predisposition for it, yeah, you're going to have to work harder. But if you enjoy the journey and you really care about the thing, it's not going to feel like pain. I mean, it will some of the time, because life, <laughs> life is pain. But <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, I, uh, Kathleen mentioned in my intro how um, I did a study where I discovered that the number of typos and grammatical errors on people's resumes mattered more than they went to school um, and where they worked. And I spent months of my life after work sitting in bed and marking up resumes and counting typos. And um, you know, I ended up writing something that was pretty cool about hiring that nobody else had done before. Uh, I, I didn't know that would happen, but I did it because I was so frustrated with how companies were hiring and I didn't care about counting typos. Um, and a lot of the, the work you're doing might be unglamorous, but if you're, if you're into it or if you have a chip on your shoulder like I did and you feel a lot of rage and you want to change, change something about the status quo, it's not going to feel that bad. So I, I would kind of encourage people to find a thing that they care about and if you really, truly care about it, that's going to give you an edge over people who are naturally very, very uh, suited to that work, but don't have the same level of passion. Very good answers. Um, so for people who don't have a traditional background, it, this might be uh, you know, maybe a, ch a chip on people's shoulders, or, or maybe perhaps we have uh, you know, opportunities that, that seem uh, unachievable because we don't have the... CS degree from Stanford, like like you know other people. Um, how does one sell the value of a non-traditional background to an employer? So every single person on this panel, myself included, we all have non-traditional backgrounds. I, I think we're pretty successful. <laughs> I don't know. I think a lot of people in this room are pretty successful. But you know, for, for you, you're either from your personal experience or how you've coached others, uh, how, how what are the best ways for you to present these? these non-linear path, career paths and this, this non-linear background to, to an employer? That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it ought to start with what kind of employers you're looking for in the first place. And there will be employers out there that value that kind of diversity and flexibility in your CV, and there will be other employers that kind of don't value that. Uh, and that's, that's the first thing. What, what are you looking for? For me, it was pretty easy. I, I joined Bertelsmann seven years ago, and I'm, I'm all over the place. So I started as a psychologist, worked a little bit in HR, then I decided to get a PhD in, in something that I still don't know anything about, and it was horrible. <laughs> um, got self-employed on the way because I didn't want to work on, on the PhD. And then I joined a consultancy, work in CRM, and now I'm back in HR, so there is no, no line whatsoever. But we're in a creative industry, and creativity typically doesn't come from a specific place. It comes from connecting different sources, and, and then something, something new is created. So it really starts with first not being afraid to show who you are. But again, look for those places where, where that is valued, and, and they are out there. And that's my, my advice to you. Yeah, I think. The, the second piece is you have to understand that getting a job is a marketing exercise and you need to be able to tell the story authentically. Yeah. Like, it's not, don't do the thing where it's like, what's your weakness? Oh, I'm a perfectionist. Like, no. <laughs> um, oh, that's a strength. Right, right. But it's, but so when, when, but I think presenting, like, asserting that your non traditional background is a value add first is crucial. Right, because then it's on the other person to challenge that you're lying. They won't do that. Um, to give you context, I started college as a vocal performance major. 
graduate of his study in Middle Eastern languages and journalism, like have a PhD in poli sci and worked in business development before someone hired me to run a global DNI department, right? Like none of that makes sense. Right, someone was drunk, hit, send offer. Um, <laughs> right? I don't think that's actually true. Um, but, but what I was able to say in that context was, actually, I'm great at public speaking. I was trained as an opera singer. I know how to communicate with people across cultures. Um, I picked up some really badass research skills. Um, and so I didn't focus on how I got the skill. And I would offer that to everyone. We've all picked up skills. And what I notice also is that people think that only skills they developed while getting paid count. And that's not true, right? So maybe you were running a major global PL function for McKinsey. And so you were managing multiple stakeholders with time and financial constraints. Or maybe you were just trying to get your three kids to soccer practice, ballet, and dinner on the table, right? And it's the exact same skill that you've used. And so I think that's something is you can always find the value add in your experience, but you have to be an excellent storyteller because the recruiters won't connect the dots for you. Yeah. So I think that that's true, but I think even getting somebody to see your story in the first place is very difficult, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have applied to companies um, on their uh, careers website and just never heard back. Uh, I think of it as screaming into a black hole. In fact, I've worked at companies where for months, nobody would look at that channel, and people would just get automatic rejections. And then you think, oh, somebody looked at who I was, went through everything I've done, and made a decision that I'm not suited for this job. And in reality, nobody cares about you. Nobody ever looked at it in the first place. So um, especially if you're a non-traditional candidate. I mean, generally, recruiters are pattern matching because they're busy. And um, I think there have been studies that say that a recruiter looks at a resume for something like six to 10 seconds before they make a decision. And when they're doing that, they're going down the list and looking for brand name, brand name, brand name. OK, you've hit the threshold of number of brand names. You're in. You don't have the brand name. You're out. That sucks. It sucks a lot. Uh, but um, if, if you're non-traditional, the reality is you're going to have to hustle. And what does that mean? It means uh, finding people who work at that company that maybe aren't in recruiting, that are actually doing the job that you want to do. So maybe it's reading their engineering blog or reading the blogs of people who work there and connecting with them based on what they're writing about and saying, you did this really cool thing. I'm interested in that. I know a little bit about it. Here's what I've done. Can I get your advice? Um, one thing I've seen over and over is that people here, and I think people in general respond very well when somebody cares about something, and I've talked about caring before. So if you're passionate and you show that passion, then people are going to want to invest in you because so few people care about anything that when it's <laughs> genuine, it's, it's so refreshing. So uh, get on Quora, get on Hacker News, read people's blogs, find those people, find their emails, reach out to them, and tell that story, uh, like Aubrey said, um, about what makes you unique and connected to what they're doing. And make it genuine. Don't talk about networking. Just you know, talk about something real. And I would like to sorry, add something. You have the right to edit your CV in an interesting way. And there's different words for, for the same thing to say. And uh, different companies want to hear different things. And there's nicer and, and, and less nice words. Just to give you an example, I, I worked actually as a bouncer in a nightclub <laughs> when I was um, when I was a student, which is kind of similar to recruiting, but that's another thing. And um, <laughs> there are several words for, for that in Germany. One is Türsteher, <laughs> sounds really bad. And then there's a nicer one, which actually comes from French, it's Selecteur. So, and the question is, what, put, what do you put in your CV? And, and um, you have the right to edit that in a nice way, as long as it kind of still portrays uh, the truth. And I encourage you to do that. Also, tongue twister. Can anybody say either of those words? <laughs> no. <laughs> and I would, I would build on what Aileen said. Um, I worked at a boot camp for a while where we did sort of similar training to what you just went through, but in person. And um, you'd get students who would graduate and were just so excited. They wanted to be a Google engineer. They wanted to be a Facebook engineer, whatever it's sort of like the buzz company of that moment was. Um, and one of the hardest things that we had to sort of convince them of is um, similar in the vein of like, shorten the distance between you and that company, right? And so interact with engineers that are there. Um, and remember that you are interviewing them as much as you, they are interviewing you. Because we saw time and time again students would get really excited to get this offer from this really cool startup. And then two months in, they're like, 
this sucks. Like, I, I don't enjoy the culture. I'm not working on what I wanted to work on. So I think as you sort of like shorten that distance, remember that like you're evaluating like, is this the type of work I want to do? Are these the people I want to work, work with? Is this going to, is this going to set up my next jump, right? Because your first, your first job is important. We have bills to pay. You have skills to develop. I get that. But like really, you're trying to think about like, what is this sort of a pathway to? And so remember as you're evaluating that like, this is a really, really crucial step for you and to interview them as much as they're interviewing you, whether that's through Quora or working on an open source project or whatever that may be. Yeah, I think um, that was a nice round uh, answer because it, it's not just about uh, positioning yourself to that company uh, and, and finding a company that's, that's a fit to you. It's, it's really more about finding a company that's a fit to you and, and your, the rest of what follows in applying for that job or interviewing for that job or actually working on that job will actually come a lot more easily, and, and you'll be a lot happier, and I think also be a lot more confident. Um, thank you for all of, all of that. That was awesome. So uh, a very quick one, superhero pose. So this was a very popular TED Talk um, a few years ago on that you could increase confidence by standing up and forming a superhero pose. So I would like, a, again, a, a panel answer, fact or fiction? Is this something that, that you've seen work? So there's uh, a lot of controversy around that in the scientific community. Um, truth is, Amy Cuddy has a new paper out where she kind of gets a lot of support for this notion. I would just say, if it helps you to feel confident in that moment, who am I to judge? If you want to dance, I, I listen to heavy metal a lot to get in the mood. So whatever gets you in the mood. Me too. <laughs> if it's power posing or listening to, to Motorhead, uh, use that. Everybody, take a drink. I was waiting for Nico to bring in, in metal into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Told you. <laughs> um, Aubrey, what, what's your take? Yeah, on? I'm. I'm generally skeptical of like this one silly trick to make you into Elon Musk, um, <laughs> right? Like clickbait. <laughs> No? Okay, bad joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think for me, it's um, I like do yoga, and so when I get stressed out, I go into this like yoga breathing, and I freak out everyone because I sound like Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. um, like that's my thing. I can explain the physiology of why it de-stresses me. But so yeah, I think it's find something that works for you, whether it's carrying something that makes you feel grounded, or you know, listening to metal or whatever it is. Um, I'm generally skeptical of the one-size-fits-all advice um, for those things. Yeah. yeah, I generally believe find something that sort of helps you prepare. So before, whether it's an interview, whether it's getting up on a panel and talking, like find something that sort of like centers you and then always have something where in the moment where if you forget to say something or I swear all the time, so if I swear and it gets me off, <laughs> off my game, like something that sort of resets you. Um, and those, are two, those can be two very different things, but I find having both of those sort of like set before you have any sort of like interaction can be super helpful. Yeah, so superhero pose, yes, no? I've tried it, metal works better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it now. Awesome. So uh, I recently read an article that said uh, some, uh, one, you know, the, the global you, uh, you should change jobs every 18 months. Um, so there's some, some wisdom out there that says, in order for you to grow in your career, you need to change jobs every 18 months. What are your, what are your thoughts on this? Is this something that, uh, you know, actually makes sense? Like, do you, in order for you to grow in your own skill set, is, is this something that, that, you know, you have to actually change what you're doing in order to make that happen? Uh, I think there, there are two things. One is growing your skill set, and two is growing your salary. <laughs> and hopefully you're in a place where those things go together, but that's not always the case. Uh, I think that you know, having worked as a recruiter and having been an engineer before that, one thing I've seen that definitely helps you grow your salary is going out and getting other offers while you're still working. In fact, um, I think that if you stay at the same company, you know, you have a yearly review, and if you're doing a good job, your salary will sort of slowly grow up incrementally. Uh, whereas if you get out there and you get a bunch of competing offers and you go to your boss and you say, look, you know, I'm uh, underpaid by 20 or 30 percent, uh, either they will give you that raise or you'll go to that next job. And then each time you can make these huge leaps. And as you get more senior, you're going to get more and more equity, which hopefully is going to be much more valuable than cash. Um, that, that's completely distinct from whether you're getting better at your job or not. And I think that that's something that individually you know when you start stagnating. Especially early in your career, you probably should leave the minute you feel like you're stagnating 
because uh, early in your career is, is what sets the tone for the rest of it. And you know, generally, the younger you are, the more plastic your brain is. That's sad but true. I'm definitely worse at programming now than I was when I was a teenager. Um, so you know, uh, just try to optimize for those things and advocate for yourself. And maybe sometimes it's a matter of switching teams within an org rather than leaving that company. Um, is hands down the most important thing is learning and being around the kinds of people that enable you to learn and push you and make you better. And the minute you feel like you're the smartest person in the room, you should get the hell out. In terms of growing your income, that is true. There's studies out there that show that you gain more over time if you change jobs more often. Mm -hmm. I would ship in something else, and I've, I've learned that term recently from a book called Firms of Endearment by uh, Raj Sizoria. And he was talking of psychological income <laughs> as opposed to monetary income. And I think enjoying what you do and growing as a person is sometimes something that you can do when you stay within one company longer. I've been with Bertelsmann for roughly seven and a half years right now. Luckily, my, my, my job has been growing all the time, and there's new initiatives every, every month and every year, and now we're doing a lot of stuff with the SEC. But there's other things and other projects that I'm actually working on for, for four or five years in a row. And this is just another dimension of a job that you will probably not see if you switch your employer every 18 months. And so maybe it's also something to explore at different phases in your life. Now, you know, I, I'm married, I have kids, I have a house. You need a little bit more stability. So sometimes you want to do something in one part of your life, maybe change early a little bit often and then find some, some phase where you just actually grow as a person within the company. Yeah. 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 Oh. I'll just Go. say, uh, <laughs> I'll make this quick. Um, I don't know the time frame is something I would optimize, optimize for. Uh, I think that's too hard to predict, especially within the context of like, smaller companies. Um, I would always think about it like, what is it that you want to run towards and make sure that you're consistently, consistently running in that direction. Sometimes that's within the company, sometimes that's outside of it. Um, and then the time frame is sort of secondary to that effect. Because what you definitely don't want to do is just say, this is terrible, I'm going to run away from it. Because that's, that's a hard sort of wheel to get stuck in. Yeah, I was just going to add is, yes, I actually agree. Like, you should, quote, change jobs every 18 months or so. But I, don't confuse your job title changing with your job changing. Yeah. So I've been at Atlassian for three years and have had the same job title. But we're a hyper growth company. And so my job has gotten bigger every week. Um, that I'm there, right? So just, just thinking about that is what does change look like for you? Um, someone might have, you know, 10 years at one company, but they may have done six different jobs or had continuously different spans of control, and that counts as a new job um, as well. And again, a lot of it comes down to you being able to articulate those changes. What skills did you gain? What responsibilities did you get? Um, rather than just focusing on job titles, which as we see people switching careers and domains are going to be less and less useful. I don't think I've ever worked at a company where the titles that people put on LinkedIn are how anyone refers to people internally, right? It's completely true. Yeah. yeah. Like titles on LinkedIn are bullshit. <laughs> yeah. on, and on that prolific note, <laughs> uh, thank you Same everybody for, for joining us and, and, uh, and hopefully you learned something useful in increasing your own confidence in your career. Thank you. Thank you.